Hello and welcome to this deep dive conversation. Racial prejudice, sexist bigotry and homophobic and transphobic commentary are now part of the scarred landscape of our online lives. While YouTube, Twitter, Facebook and the other internet giants merely squirm whenever the online attack dogs taste blood, there is now an overriding sense that extremism isn't a bug in the system, it is the system, with hate speech a key dynamic in ever lucrative internet business models. For some, this is no cause for concern. The web is to them the last resort of outspoken and candid exchange. For others, however, the online space is a bear pit, overwhelmed by dangerous and malevolent hate mongers who drown out decency, common sense and fair play under a tsunami of bilious invective. With me to examine the impact of hate speech is the human rights lawyer, Dr. Natalie Alkiviadu. Dr. Alkiviadu is a regular contributor to international conferences and television programs in her native Cyprus, and she's just recently coordinated a project to create the first platform on hate speech available in English and Greek. Dr. Alkiviadu's current research focuses on the legal regulation of the far right, as well as the regulation of internet hate and hate crime. As well as lecturing in law at the University of Central Lancashire, based in Cyprus, Dr. Alkiviadu is also a founding member and director of Equitas, an NGO working on human rights education. And I'm delighted that she's my guest today for this deep dive conversation. Natalie, you're very welcome today. Thanks for coming. Thanks for the invitation. How and why did you get interested in human rights education, Dr. Arkiviadu? Um, I think it was following my disappointment with uh, the implementation of the law. So I had worked on a, a project uh, for asylum seekers and refugees, um, and I saw that the law wasn't being properly implemented. And I was trying to understand why, and I realized that at the core of the matter, was the fact that the people who were in charge of implementing the law and in charge of ensuring the rights of these people were in fact marred by prejudices. So I thought, okay, we need to do something to bring in uh, education. Is there something in your background that makes you particularly sensitive to the plight of, of migrants or people disadvantaged. The thing that we say to lawyers, you could have chosen to do commercial law and you'd be sitting in uh, the lap of luxury right now. So what, what was it that made you interested in this area of work? Personally, I'm not sure if I have anything in, in, in my own life. I mean, my mum is a, is a migrant. She's from the UK and uh, she came here to marry my dad. Maybe somehow, you know, watching her um, develop here, that, that could have affected me. I'm not sure. Um, as for commercial law, it's just too boring. Uh, but uh, aside from, uh, uh, from that, I think that it, it's just so important. And I think that it's so lacking in my country that, um, you know, it, it's, it, it's necessary. It's very interesting. Uh, people from the European Union are not often described as migrants when they go to other European Union countries. <laughs> but is there, that, that's interesting. Do you, did you sense that there may well be a difference in the way in which English migrants are treated in Cyprus? Definitely, definitely, because the, the treatment of migrants is directly affiliated to uh, their status. Uh, so um, uh, this, uh, of course, is directly linked to, to money as well. Uh, so in Cyprus, for example, there's a large population of uh, people from Russia. Uh, they are much better received than, for example, uh, people arriving from conflict zones. Uh, and this is because of the, 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 the monetary status. Um, also, there is uh, this kind of um, link to people coming from the Middle East, let's say, this Islamophobia that um, is, is affiliated uh, to them, regardless of whether they are um, uh, Muslim or not. So I do think that Europeans do have it easier. Not all Europeans. I do see a, um, a rise in prejudice towards, for example, Romania and uh, Bulgaria. So people from Romania and Bulgaria living on the island in comparison to, for example, my mother. Uh, so it all, it, it, it's all depending on your own personal situation, your own status. Um, and at the end of the day, it comes down to money as well. We're going to talk about the situation in Cyprus later in our conversation, uh, Dr. Alkiviadu. But just on this point, do you think that Cyprus is particularly interesting? Because amongst the European countries, 
it has a fairly recent experience of the multicultural environment. I think so. I think that everything has happened on this island too quickly um, and we haven't had time really to develop ourselves as a society, let alone as an intercultural society. Maybe later we can get back to the terms. I think it's important to analyse what we mean by multicultural, intercultural and how important the meanings are actually uh, for, for, for our realities. But yeah, I think in Cyprus everything has happened too quickly that we just don't know how to deal with things and placing that within the generic framework of, of the ongoing in conflict and the nationalism, often the aggressive nationalism that's affiliated to that, um, just makes things everything everything so complicated right. and interesting, of course. I indeed, indeed. Um, you focused on human rights education, Dr. Alkiviado, as a key weapon in the fight against online hate speech. It seems to be a, a typical response. What does it mean for you? Okay, so this morning I was thinking of a upcoming interview, and I was. I, I had a like revelation. Um, it's like if your child has a fever, you're going to give him carpal, uh, and the fever will go down, but the infection will still be there. You need antibiotics for the infection, right? So if we just regulate hate speech and take it down, uh, it'll go for a while, like the fever, but the infection doesn't go away. The infection won't go away with the laws. The infection won't go away with regulation. The infection won't go away with taking things down off social platform. It will only go away if there is proper awareness, sensitization, and education. So that's why it's a powerful and sustainable tool, it's in my opinion. It is a powerful and sustainable tool. It also demands massive resources if it's going to be done effectively. Yes. Can you conceive the circumstances in which those with control of the purse strings would ever devote the, the amount of resources necessary to really tackle this, uh, this problem? I think that mm, I, I definitely agree with you. I mean, human rights education needs to be occurring within the system and not just outside the system because, unfortunately, in the majority of European countries, we as non-governmental organizations or weird academics or anything else are outside the system. Uh, it's only until those people or people with that kind of thinking infiltrate into the system that something will change because the system at the end of the day is people and if we do get in, in, into it then that, that's the only way but that you know it, it's going to take time it's going to take time let me just bring you back to this point on human rights education when you say human rights education and we've already had this conversation about the resources that would be needed to make this to make human rights education really work on on the scale we need it to work other people hear those words uh, dr alkiviadu and they say that's code for long-term political political indoctrination of young people with politically correct statist ideas. Why are they wrong? Political correctness, I mean, it's just taken over this whole uh, discussion and debate, and it's such an obstacle. And you know what? It's also because this has been handled very wrongly. This whole theme of human rights education has been handled very wrongly by a lot of people and institutions. Um, it's not political correctness and it's not manipulation. It's the basic teaching of the basic values which are enshrined in international human rights law, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, in the European Convention on Human Rights. All the documents which supposedly guide European democracies today, if we can call them democracies, because a lot of us are, are, are you know, striding away from that framework. So it's the basic values found in everything that was ratified and signed and passed after the Second World War. It was that never again slogan that we're supposed to stick to. And all of a sudden, oh, but we're being political, politically correct. No, we're not. We're simply ensuring the values for that never again that we've all quickly forgotten over the past 10 years, especially. So, yeah, that's what I would say to them. Human rights education is considered by you and other human rights defenders, uh, Dr. Alkiviadu, as the antidote to uh, this flourishing online and offline hate speech. Do you believe that we are losing the battle against hate speech? I think that um, we are, to an extent, 
because we don't really know what we're doing. We're moving in a million different directions. We don't even agree what should be done. We don't even agree on what hate speech means. So, yeah, things are going wrong. Uh, human rights education is one of the antidotes, but not the only antidote. Uh, so alone, it's not the answer, but it's definitely a major and sustainable one. Um, but if if we are to win this battle, if it can be won, yeah, uh, we need to do other things as well. And those other things are big structural amendments to the way society functions. Because hate speech, as I said, is just a fever. It, it's the manifestation of an underlying intolerance, which I, didn't I just... That. I yeah. love that analogy, Dr. Alkiviadu. So, if hey, if human rights education is not is not the 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 main antidote, what other things need to be in place to dismantle and disarm hate speech and hate mongers? So, let's say we see a rise in hate speech uh, against refugees arriving in the European Union from conflict zones. Um, that hate speech is a manifestation of an intolerance towards people from different ethnic groups and predominantly people of a Muslim background. That has been cultivated within the system on mainstream media by uh, rhetoric of politicians, not only far-right politicians, because unfortunately what we're seeing is that more moderate politicians of the left as well are mimicking what the far-right is saying in order not to lose votes to the far right. So we are seeing this perceived crisis against uh, within the European Union being developed by different actors, which in turn fuels this intolerance. And that intolerance in turn is manifested as hate speech. So until we start dealing with things properly and stop creating all these intolerances and developing crises that don't actually exist, uh, and seeing things in a positive light. Have we ever had a proper discussion, a, a well-rounded discussion about positive aspects of, of, of migrants coming into the European Union? Have we? Never. You know, on an institutional level. It's always the refugee crisis. And this terminology is adopted also by European Union institutions. Why? The term crisis, I mean, we're people. We affiliate bad things, worrying things, emergency things things that we need to do quickly in order to get over this crisis. And slowly, slowly, we, we, we get manifestations such as hate speech and then things like hate crime. So it's structural as well. Well, on that point then, why do you believe hate speech is so attractive to so many people? Um, why is it so attractive? You've said that the politicians are taking these right-wing shibboleths and putting them into the mainstream. That must yes. mean then that there is something in these very reductionist arguments that, that, that chime with people's experience. So why do you think, as somebody who spends a lot of time in the public space as a public intellectual, defending human rights education and challenging extremist ideas, why, are, why is hate speech so attractive to so many people? Uh, identity. We have been born into this world and we have been raised and developed as humans with this big lust for our identity uh, and by constructing and deconstructing a very different other, an other who is so much more inferior than us, we feed on this feeling of identity uh, and I do see that and I see that with young people and I see that, you know, uh, being, being manipulated by a variety of actors and, and, and it is very, very sad. So is that then this famous uh, white victimhood that has been created, perhaps as a, as a response to the emergence in the public space of other people's identity? For example, the whole civil rights movement, post-colonial movements, all of these Black Lives Matter, LGBTIQ movements, feminist movements, as other groups have claimed their identities yeah. have white people said well we also need to defend our identity is that what you're referring to um partly i think it's um also just this purely uh internal satisfaction of feeling that we actually our identity as it has been constructed over time and in our lifetime is in fact superior than the people 
people coming in or whatever. Uh, in relation to what you say, I think now the majority is feeling, oh, actually, it, it's not about reclaiming their identity. It's, you know what, you're not on your own anymore in the public domain. There are other people. People have voices. And maybe this is another element to the whole discourse. Is this notion of identity that much closer, more pertinent, more sensitive in the context of Cyprus? Definitely, definitely. I mean, here we have the conflict. Uh, um, uh, it's ongoing. It's infiltrated. It's marked the creation of our educational system, the formal educational system. Uh, and it, it definitely is because we, we also affiliate the, uh, the invasion and, and the occupation and our current political problem with uh, people coming in. So you see a lot of the nationalist and far-right rhetoric uh, underlining that, oh, and now the refugees are coming and they're Muslim too, and soon Cyprus will be Muslim, and we're all going to disappear, and the, the white race uh, is going to disappear from this island, and the orthodox faith is going to be eliminated and all that. So yeah, it definitely does play a role in it. As I said, it, it is very sad. What should be done to make majority communities in Cyprus and elsewhere in Europe less fearful about their futures, mm -hmm. the lives of their children, their, their, their societies, their culture? How do, you, how do you take the fear out of the politics? Right, so um, I'm not a political scientist, uh, but from the, from the way I see things, I see two things. I see the short-term, mid-term, long-term aspect, and then the long-term sustainable aspect. So in the short, mid-term, long-term, I do see education, I do see awareness raising, I do see sensitization, all infiltrated within the structure. On the more long-term scale, which is where we're really going to have a proper solution to, to what we're going through, is the stopping of this perception of minority majority, us and the other, this intercultural society. A multicultural society, I mean, what's the meaning? The meaning of a multicultural society is that we have a society with different ethnic groups and those ethnic groups just live around each other and the majority tolerates the, major the, the, the minority. We don't want toleration. We want this positive element of living together. We want the intercultural society where the different ethnic groups are truly living together in a positive light and that the different groups are perceived by the majority as something positive. And once this perception comes, then we slowly start going over this whole majority-minority discourse. Because we ourselves, I mean, I, I do it in my papers, I do it in my, in my speeches, and I'm forced to, I segregate us. It's everything against my beliefs, but I'm segregating too if I'm talking about the majority and the minority, and at this particular point in time, we have to do it. But our aim is to overcome this. Allow me to, to push back against that. Your idea of, of, of the multicultural or intercultural society you could say it worked when migration was uh, essentially Europeans moving to other countries that were dominated by Europeans. Now we've got this situation where you've got visibly different minorities moving into European countries. And that's where the resistance is, because there is this notion that no matter how long they're there, they're never quite British, Cypriot, French, Portuguese, Spanish. So how do you change that dynamic so that the visible difference is no mm. barrier to the yeah. status of citizen? But the perception, yeah, I, I do understand. And everything, you know, my ideas are going to take time if they're going to happen. But visible difference, I mean, we're not born. And when we start talking and thinking, we think, ah, oh, visible difference. And that's not good. So we can't live together. It's all socially constructed. And that social construction emanates from the actors that we mentioned before and the frameworks we mentioned before, so media, education, etc. So if European leaders and stakeholders of the European countries that we're talking about actually do take it seriously and stop constructing this visible difference as something bad, because there's visible differences which are perceived as something good. I mean, if you're in Cyprus and you have blonde hair, that's a visible difference, but that's wonderful. You know, so it's how we construct that difference. Isn't 
one of the key ways of making people less fearful about their status, their position in society, and the future of their society and culture. Giving them access to work, giving them a sense of optimism. And now that the money is running out in Europe, that's the, that's the dynamic that is really sharpening the, the concerns. And you being in Cyprus, you must be, alas, painfully aware of just how yeah. much society can be transformed when the money runs out. Yeah, definitely. This is, I agree with you 100%. Uh, and there's a couple of things I want to mention on this point. Number one, the issue of social and economic rights and the protection of social and economic rights for all people in society is fundamental. Let's not forget how, I mean, this is sounding, you know, completely stereotypical in the classical talk, but I mean, it's important to remember, but let's not forget the framework and the situation and the monetary situation that allowed uh, facilitated Hitler's rights. You know, it, it, it doesn't happen when you're not hungry and when you've got a job. I agree 100%. On the other hand, however, and as I argue as well in my papers, is uh, a lot of people, and I, and I read this much too often, is they blame, for example, the rise of Golden Dawn in Greece because of the financial situation in Greece. It's definitely a fundamental factor, but it's not the only one because it would just be much easier for all of us and the leaders and the institutions to just say, you know what, once the financial crisis is over, that they'll be, they'll be gone. No, they won't. And they're not just the result of the, the crisis. It's one of the major things. That's the one thing. Uh, the second thing is what we do see in the European Union is that states and the institutions themselves have manipulated the crisis the social, uh, the, sorry, the, the financial and economic crisis in order to create the situation of emergency and to start cutting uh, social uh, welfare, to start deteriorating the social state. Uh, and, and we see that social and economic rights are no longer sustainable within this emergency framework. So that's the other point I wanted to make. But definitely, if we are pursuing a society where social and economic rights are properly protected and promoted for everyone, then we are definitely on a good track. On, on this issue of, of the conditions necessary for extremism, well, let me put this to you. Uh, how easy is it, uh, Dr. al Kibiado, to be a human rights defender at a time when the financial meltdown in your own country and in neighbouring Greece means that many people just don't understand why the country is imploding and at the same time admitting more and more visibly different minorities who don't speak Greek? That is the fundamental of hate speech offline, which then mutates and flourishes online. Do you, do you recognize that connection? And how do you argue against it? I definitely recognize this, uh, this connection. I definitely blame this massive deterioration of social and economic rights in defaulting countries. This absolute, not absolute, but nearly absolute mania on, on protecting the Eurozone, but all of a sudden, forgetting all about the social and economic rights which are incorporated in the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, for example. So I do blame institutions, I do blame the states who have been part of this as well, if they had any sovereignty in dealing with any of this, that's another issue. And I do find it very, very difficult to justify a lot of the things when people are in a dire situation. However, the, 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 the root of the matter is that the two are not inextricably linked. It's not the fault of the few Syrian refugees that Cyprus has received, the very few, by the way, in comparison to other states. It's not their fault that we have trouble. It's very easy, though, for our leaders uh, or, 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 or the nationalist uh, politicians and, and the rhetoric that exists in general to blame them. Do you see what I mean? It's all about scapegoating. It's, it's combining two things which are not combinable, but have been combined by people who can benefit from this combination. If we, if we now look at um, this issue of, of hate speech, uh, Dr. Akiviadi, what do you say to those people who believe that the threat of hate speech, particularly the threat of hate speech online, has been exaggerated so as to create the conditions for a clampdown on web freedom in general? 
If you look at the development of the web, there has always been this protest on the part of those with power that, uh, first of all, if you use the web, there is a danger that your identity would be stolen. Then the web was dangerous because it would be used to groom children. Then it's dangerous because of the threat of fake news and what they call computational propaganda. Now the latest iteration of the fear is to worry about the, 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 the rise of hate speech and the threat to our diverse multicultural environments. What they say is, is that it's possible to find examples of racial, sexist and homophobic, transphobic insults, but you have to go looking for it if you really want to find uh, serious diatribes, and that it isn't everywhere, and that they worry that by locking into identity politics, this is going to be the ruse, the, the Trojan horse, by which our web freedoms will be restricted. What do you make of that as an argument? As somebody who's really researched into this. Okay, so there's two elements. The first thing you mentioned was that whether it's exaggerated, online hate with, you know, if it's actually so dangerous, it's extremely dangerous. And I mean, I can't disclose, uh, you know, cases that I've come across for, you know, for purposes of protecting personal data, but there's horrific things and 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 what i've witnessed in 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 cases even you know in, in the past few months is that uh this has moved to the offline sphere where people had been victimized uh i can talk generically one case uh because of the person's um sexual identity and um a fake news affiliated to what that person allegedly had done when he wasn't even in the country how that moved to the offline where they were threatening him we're going to come and find you and we're going to do this to you and we're going to do that to you i mean that's just a simple example of you know it, it's no joke and that's not just one example we have a, a series of such examples and 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 when we because uh, uh my ngo does the um, monitoring uh for the european commission for the code of conduct on illegal hate speech and and sometimes you know i'm thinking the people who are part of this, you know, my colleagues, I wonder sometimes whether they, I should offer some kind of assistance to them um, psychologically as well with what they witness, the images they witness, the, the rhetoric they witness. Uh, they get used to it at some point, but I mean, it's horrific. So, you know, that, that's the one thing, and it, and it does move offline as well, and we see that happening. And then the second thing is, when we witness the use of online hate, I mean, this is just something that worries me a lot for the actual election of, of, of far right uh, um, uh, nationalists, far right uh, uh, politicians. I mean, it you know, it's cheap, cheap, it's quick, it's easy, it's you know, it facilitates and and in my country for sure it assisted the the election of of people from the far right party. So all this, I mean, if if this isn't enough to respond to the people who think we're overreacting, then you know, I you know, people are so stuck. What what really gets to me is that people are so stuck in that classical theoretical million um, free speech hate speech debates and all that marketplace for ideas and all that, you know. But we're not in a, in a free marketplace. People aren't free. People aren't equal in the marketplace of ideas. Uh, and we need to get over, over it. If I'm, if I'm a, not even a hater, just someone with a uh, hater under the law, which we'll get to later, but someone with some stupid nationalist ideas, and all I'm doing is posting on Facebook and wherever else all day against the refugees who are in Cyprus, that refugee in the camp in Larnaca has probably limited access in order to respond. Do you see what I mean? That's not a free marketplace. If that someone is uttering homophobic and transphobic and biphobic speech against uh, people in Cyprus, I can assure you that a lot of LGBTI people will not want to come and counter argue what they're saying because they want to keep the fact that they are, for example, gay or lesbian, a secret from their family. So we're not in a, in a free marketplace of ideas that, you know, we can all speak and the, 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 the right voice will then prevail and all that. No, it's not like that. That's not reality. We don't live in an equal society. 
Another charge from critics, um, Dr. Archiviadu, is that on this issue of hate speech, it seems to them that the only type of hate speech that is currently the subject of international campaigns is that proposed by white Christian people. They, they look at the hate speech of other ethnic and religious groups and they say that that is allowed to flourish unchecked because of politically correct bias and a fear of upsetting minorities. What do you make of that? Well, I think it goes back to the previous comment that we had, the, the previous discussion we made about how political correctness has, and sorry for this, but in the UK especially, um, has overridden a lot of the discourse and the proper imp implementation of, of relevant legislation. However, we should start shining away from that now and actually focusing on the fact that law doesn't just protect a certain uh, ethnic group. It protects all ethnic groups. And, uh, um, yeah, I, unfortunately, in some institutions and some leaders and some politicians and some stakeholders have made a mess of it, have made a mess of, of a lot of things. And uh, this is why we have this. But it, it can be rectified. It can be rectified. But if you allow me to, 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 to come back to this issue, um, extreme Muslim bias against Jews uh, prejudicial comments made by certain black speakers against white people, uh, prejudice aimed uh, from Hindus and Sikhs at uh, Muslims. This doesn't fall within the international campaigns that are very visible. Mm -hmm. My question to you is, are we interested in fighting hate speech or are we just worried about the lethal consequences of white hate speech? I think it's because the international campaigns have been developed in order to um, rectify the, loophole, the loopholes left from the mainstream structure of society. That mainstream structure is not protecting the minorities, hence the need for these international movements, grassroots or not. Do you see what I mean? So the minorities per se are not properly and adequately protected by the structure. And that's why we need the movement. So that, that's why we see that difference. It doesn't mean that some are enjoying more rights than others. Not at all. It's just that some may have not required or necessitated or their situation has not necessitated the need for a campaign, I think. I, I hear what you say, but they would say that it goes a bit further than that, Dr. Archiviadu. What they're saying is, is that these campaigns are designed to solicit white guilt and that this white guilt then can have political consequences because it can lead to uh, more and more migrants entering into our societies and a far more statist approach to the distribution of resources. We can see this being played out in the United States at the moment. W what do you make of that? To be honest, I think at that point of the discussion, I would just give up because that is just so far-fetched. I know that, unfortunately, it, even though it's so far-fetched, it's manifested itself in the worst po possible way in the USA. And that is, and again, it is because free speech is nearly absolute. Uh, it's, it, for me, it's the perfect example for everyone who is saying, oh, overreacting about hate speech and overreacting about limiting uh, free speech and this and that and the marketplace. But, yeah, but look what's happened in the USA. It is the result of that amendment on absolute free speech. Not the result of, but that was one of the facilitating factors for everything else. So uh, at some point, we need to stop this mania that is marking the discourse. Because it, there's no logical response. There's a point in a discussion where it's just no, not logical anymore. Dr. Archiviadu, let me um, quote to you a section from your own website, uh, which defines hate speech. Hate speech shall be understood as covering all forms of expression which spread, incite, promote, or justify racial hatred, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, or other forms of hatred based on intolerance, including intolerance expressed by aggressive nationalism and ethnocentrism, ethnocentrism, discrimination and hostility against minorities, migrants, and people of immigrant origin. There will be some, Dr. Archiviadu, who will hear and read that definition and fear that it would stifle any form of legitimate debate on social issues of our time. Let me give you an example. Cressida Dick, the commissioner 
of the Metropolitan Police in the United Kingdom has said that young black men and boys were statistically more likely to be the victims and perpetrators of knife crime in the UK capital. Under such a broad definition of hate speech, does that not screen out any of these conversations that we need to have which do focus on the behaviour of certain ethnic social groups? Definitely. Now, that definition is a definition of the Council of Ministers of the of the, um, the Council of Ministers, the Council of Europe uh, institution. Uh, there is a problem with that definition. Another problem, which I'll discuss in a minute. What I do want to say, and what was underlined in the cl closing conference of the No Hate Speech movement that we were at the other day, is the contextual contextualization of definitions of meanings so if I take that meaning and I take it away from the UK and I take it away from the, the excellent example you just gave and I place it in the heart of Hungary or in the heart of Poland I can see how I can use it properly for protection if I place it within the framework that you've just given me then no that I'm I'm, I'm stifling you know proper development. So it is all about contextualization. It's not about taking a definition and, and just using it arbitrarily. The problem with that definition, in my opinion, although we use it for the protection of ethnic minorities, is that visibly people are missing. Sexual minorities are missing. Uh, uh, people who are targeted because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Gender is missing. Um, and, and this is unfortunately something we see throughout the relevant institutions, United Nations, European Union and Council of Europe. LGBTI people are always missing from any legislation and definition. So that would be the problem I would see with that definition. Uh, if we return again to this issue of hate speech, the, the point of the last example was to say that sometimes it might be useful from a social point of view to focus on ethnic groups and the behaviour of certain ethnic groups in order to improve the situation. So they would say that, look, uh, what might appear to be hate speech in one context isn't at all. I don't know if I would accept that. You certainly don't. But, but let's move on. Would you accept, Dr. Alkiviadu, that the attraction of hate speech is that it may carry, it may carry with it the germ of an idea that rings true for many people? For example, uh, we've talked before about how is it possible for Cyprus and Greece to be in the midst of financial chaos and at the same time be bringing in migrants. You say, well, it's not the migrants who are responsible, but sometimes it's the optics of a situation mm. that have massive impact. So uh, the point I want to make in this question is, can we really tackle hate speech without tackling the economic disparities, the moral dislocation and the status collapse that fuels so much of it? Mm. So... Um Two things. Firstly, you mentioned the word truth, and it reminds me of the other word you mentioned before, visibly different. I mean, what is truth? How is truth constructed? Who is truth constructed by? Okay, that's the first thing. Without getting too philosophical so early in the morning, that's not really no, that we can, early. We can but, get you know. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> right, so that's, just, that's the first thing. And the second thing, uh, which again, and you know what, then I'm stereotyped as an academic because of my arguments but it's the structures you know our structures our societies as I've said in this interview and time and again are unequal there are people who are more equal than others in the society we live in and from the moment that there are such social and economic disparities as you say then we don't have a chance for a sustainable, a sustainable approach. So structurally, and the structural discrimination that marks so much of our lives, both on an interpersonal level, a societal level, a group level, a political level, an institutional level, it's everywhere. Things aren't going to change. I mean, it's the example also linked to what, what, what you're saying is, um, I'm not sure if you remember, but in my presentation in Strasbourg, I had mentioned how important it is to have proper informal learning. So the learning that we have in our daily lives. So I gave the example of a child in, in this country going to school, getting excellent 
formal education with elements of human rights education, then going in the afternoon to a youth club and doing a bunch of activities on, you know, human rights education through Council of Europe handbooks, and then going home and getting his dinner served and his bath made and his clothes ironed by a domestic worker. We have over 30,000 domestic workers living in a country of less than a million. Mostly right? of Bangladesh and Chinese origin. Yes, yes. Uh, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Philippines, Vietnam, Nepal. These women are living. Not, I mean, I mean, the salary is not even 400 euros, and they're working. We had done a research a few years ago. An average of 15 hours a day, six days a week. Some not even getting their Sundays off in the house of the employer. I love my job, but I would never like to live there. And no one is ever going to ask me to live at my job. Why? Because I'm an academic. My status is different. But this is an anathema to human rights. So yes, I, I do agree with you. Let me put it to you, Dr. Alkiviadu, that you are just being curmudgeonly. That you have a political agenda which is about tackling structural inequalities. Uh, and that hate speech is the way in which you can move forward with these ideas because of the impact and traction that identity politics has in our society. And that if you actually looked around, you would see that Europe is doing quite well when it comes to absorbing people who've come from different parts of the world, who have different cultural uh, ideas, different religious backgrounds. If you go to Kenya, the East African community, certainly in the late 90s, were very nervous when there was elections because they knew that they would be the target. In many countries, for example, West Africa, Syrians, in Malaysia, Chinese people, they would also be the target of a lot of hate speech. In, in South Africa, Zimbabwean migrant workers are murdered. We have many examples of terrible things happening in Europe, but by and large, the political class does favour a fair play approach towards minorities and maybe we need to say that maybe we need to celebrate the genius of Europe in absorbing and making welcome people who are visibly different with different religious and cultural backgrounds what do you make of that as a point of view firstly the term absorbing which is used, uh, I know you're putting forward the, the position of the critics and, and that's why uh, you're using it, but we need to underline absorbing, integrating, assimilating. What is it that we want to do? We have, want a factory line and to make, you know, another 10 uh, little Europeans that fit just fine with us so we can tolerate them just fine because they're adopting our own habits. I mean, that again, it's just not acceptable. Uh, well, that's one thing. Uh, and the second thing, let's not forget that now talking historically, Europe as a region developing itself uh, within all this framework has had a, you know, more years to do so. Let's not forget the past of the countries you're mentioning and the impact of Europe on those countries, even my country, the strife that exists as a result of our reality as a colony. You know, this division that has occurred, this segregation that's even manifested in our constitution is all a result of European practice, particularly uh, practice of the United Kingdom. And, and that's why we're later than other countries to, you know, accept certain changes. That's one of the reasons why. So I guess that that could also be moved to the examples that you're giving. I'm not justifying any human rights violations, but you need to... To, to, to consider, you know, countries in their context, with, with my country being one of the examples. That's the one thing. And the second thing, I live in Europe. I study, you know, uh, laws which apply to Europe. It's no justification if other things are happening in other regions. For example, I get this quite a bit in, in seminars and stuff. They say, well, if, you, if I'm giving a, a talk on Islamophobia, for example, well, if you go to Saudi Arabia, I bet that this and that and the other would happen. I don't care, you know? I care what's going on here. I care that we are a European Union. Article 2 of the Treaty on the European Union, the foundation of the European Union, says that we're based on principles of solidarity, equality, etc., 
if we're saying that we're that, then we should be that. If we don't want to be that, then just don't say it and don't make that primary law, if you see what I mean. I think the debate around hate speech has moved on, Dr. Akiviadu. It's no longer free expression versus hate speech. I think that, that, that argument has changed a little bit, but I think it's, it's very important. What do you say to, these, to those who argue that the right of free expression is more important than the wish of others not to be upset or discomforted by what they read, watch or hear online? Right. Uh, I think I would agree with you that the arguments and, you know, the discourse on hate speech has definitely developed. I wouldn't say that the free speech, hate speech argument is old. And I'll, I'll tell you why. In 2008, the European Union passed the framework decision, which is basically the only document they have to tackle hate speech. And that was very, that the development of that document was very tightly affiliated with free speech concerns. The reservations made by a great number of countries on hate speech provisions in different UN documents are deeply, deeply affected by free speech concerns. So I wouldn't say that we're over it completely. Uh, there is definitely, it's, it's still, you know, right at the core, um, in my opinion, although it's developed into other areas. What I would say to, to people, you know, um, discussing free speech uh, concerns is that marketplace argument. You know, I'm all for free speech because I, I, I practice it and, and I love it and I love other people practicing it and I love it when I'm having discussions, but I, I don't like it and I don't think it, it should be around um, when it's actually causing structural, fundamental or physical harm. Free speech isn't hate speech uh, by default under law. And uh, I think this is something that we need to, to take into consideration. What I would come and say is that what concerns me about um, hate speech regulation is the reaction of the haters. That's what worries me. And that's what's worrying me in relation to Golden Dawn and, and their trial now. Uh, they're being tried for running a criminal organization. And it really worries me what, what's going to happen at the end of this trial. What's going to happen to their supporters and their followers? You know, shutting someone up or closing someone down, it doesn't just make them disappear. That worries me. So, and that, that's the area that needs to be looked at. So yeah. what should we do? Does this, does it, are we now in a sort of a circular moment in our, yeah. in our conversation? We go back to the human rights education. Your argument has been, Dr. Akiviadu, that uh, human rights education is one, of, is one tool in a, in a toolkit, so to speak. How yeah. do you reach people who are no longer in schools, who may not be part of trade unions, if trade unions even exist, who aren't part of civic or religious groups, and who feel marginalized, and these extreme groups are the only place where they feel appreciated and respected, and where their ideas are not, you know, completely laughed at or, or, or criticized. How do you reach those people? Hasn't the internet just amplified the kind of self-selection that, that happens in, gen in general in society? Definitely, and it is a concern. I mean, one of the main concerns I have with human rights education is the target group, the fact that the people participating in activities, at least in this country, and from what I hear in a lot of other countries, are the usual suspects, the people who are already sensitized, the people who are already adopting the values we wish to promote, and that's the activities being less beneficial. So definitely the target groups are, are very significant. Um, how do I get to those target groups? Uh, it's very, very, very difficult without structural support to get to those target groups. What That's do you mean by thing. structural support? By the state. So, um, for example, if I'm having a, an activity for young people within the framework of my NGO, it's, it's a voluntary participation, right? You can't force anyone to come to a, a non-formal learning activity conducted by civil society. Note, though, that in Europe, the majority of learning that is happening within the framework of human rights is happening precisely within that framework. However, if the state, for example, cooperated with civil society, and in, in many countries they do, just not so much in, in, in mine, on a sustainable uh, level, in order to take that learning and integrate it in 
the formal educational system, not just by having one talk or having some priorities. You know, we have the priority that we need to tackle racism and teachers in our schools can have some optional training on human rights related themes. They don't have to though. So if we were to have a proper cooperation with the Ministry of Education in order to bring these two together, then yes, I'm reaching the whole school. I'm not just reaching the kids who want to come to the activity of, of my NGO. That's the first thing. So yeah. why is that not happening? Surely the state has, a, has an investment in social peace. There are more and more migrants. There are more and more minorities visiting Cyprus as tourists. You have an increasing, for want of a better term, domestic class who come from different parts of, of the world. That is creating an environment where uh, law enforcement, policy makers, want to ensure that people get along. So... So the, the idea of the state as a guarantor of this kind of human rights education seems to me to be obvious. So why is that not happening? Well, there's definitely been an improvement, at least from the time that, let's say, my age was uh, the school, uh, at school. Uh, there's definitely been an improvement. We have the priorities, for example, of tackling hate speech, tackling racism, the different things that the schools need to pursue. We have an institute providing some trainings if the teachers want to, and I underline that because I think it's very important. Um, uh, but don't forget that our educational system, notwithstanding all these new priorities with our new realities, is deeply and almost absolutely founded on our national problem. It's absolutely constructed in a way so that we never forget. That's the aim of our educational system. And since that is our aim, and it's obvious, I mean, never forget is, 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 our, is our slogan. Um, uh, everything else is second, secondary. And human rights education can't be secondary. And there is this, the other problem is in a country like Cyprus, there is this perceived, you'll never see this written, but there is this perceived lack of correlation or incongruency between human rights education and never forgetting what they did to us. I'm always speaking in, um, you know, with quotation marks. So that can't work together. So I think that's why. Although it appears obvious to us, it's just not happening. But there is a development, I would say. Tell us more about your work in Cyprus to tackle hate speech, Dr. Alkaviadi. Uh, well, I try on, 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 on two, three, three levels. So when I'm teaching my, my curricula at university, uh, for example, I, I teach human rights and I'll have a, a, a lecture on freedom of expression. I do make sure to incorporate, you know, cases of the European Court of Human Rights which are related to hate speech. I open up the floor of discussion and I, I think it's very important for the students to have that learning experience. So I do that in terms of teaching my students. I, I do it in terms of my, my academic work. All my papers are just shouting for this, you know, need for structural change, that anything we do on we can arrange all the conferences and discussions in the world. We can pass as many laws as we like. We are not going to see an equitable society unless we see structural change. And before that, until we look, until we realize that we are living in an unequal society. So that's the second thing. And the third thing, the NGO conducts human rights education, predominantly to, uh, within the framework of, um, of youth work with targets being young people, but they come voluntarily. Online hate speech is a manifestation of offline discontent. Um, give us an idea of what's happening in Cyprus that legitimizes this racist, misogynist, homophobic, transphobic discourse, and how that then, that then mutates online. Give us an idea of the environment in Cyprus that, that creates the conditions that allows this hate speech to flourish mm. offline as well as online? Okay, so there's two factors. The first factor is that, as I mentioned before, in Cyprus, everything's happened too quickly. We've, you know, we got our independence. Again, it's not really independence in, quotate, in, in quotation marks, but we got it in 1960, and all these different things have happened. I mean, 
uh, if you come to Limassol now and you came five years ago, you won't even recognize it, you know. Uh, so things are happening very, very, very quickly. So that's the first thing. When a society develops so quickly, it doesn't have time to develop a lot of the skills and attitudes which are necessary to adjust to these different. But what do you mean by right? development? Are you talking about construction boom because Ty- Cyprus has become a major tourist destination over the last 30 or 40 years? Or are you talking about demographic explosion? What do you mean? Everything. So people coming to live here, to work here, to be our domestic workers because that's what people from Asia are in Cyprus, unfortunately. This is the, the, the framework we've, we've set up. Uh, people coming from uh, European countries, things developing in terms of there's more discussion on LGBTI rights. We have for the past few years, you know, a gay pride which is in in June this year, you know, all these kind of developments, social, demographic, everything that's within the general framework of, 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 you know, a societal advancement. Um, But because it's happened so quickly, uh, we haven't had time to adjust, to develop our attitudes, to develop our skills, to be able to manage ourselves in, in, in this. So that's the first thing. And the second thing that marks everything in our society, it marks the way we we function, our New Year's Eve message by the president or whoever gives it, is and everything else in, in, in our lives from the moment that we're born, if we were born after that, is is the conflict. It marks us so much. And that is definitely one of the reasons. And it's normal for it to mark us because it's ongoing. Uh, but of course, I live in in, in the south, and uh, it, it's very much cultivated to match, you know, how the Greek Cypriots perceive the conflict. Uh, so all these together constitute a wonderful framework for the for the haters and a very fertile ground for other, you know, intolerances to be developed because we do what identification. So refugees, as I said, perceive them as Muslim if they are or if they're not with the invader. There is definitely that affiliation. That's one example. And in terms of LGBTI rights, uh, although we've had um, gay pride for a few years, although we've had some good laws being passed, although slowly, slowly, I definitely see a a development in in society. Don't forget that Cyprus is very, very much an orthodox country Uh, and when I mean orthodox I don't necessarily mean what people believe and what they think their life means and where they're going to go when they die but I mean the church the church as an institution and the power of that church is humongous and that uh, really contributes to a lot of the hate speech against LGBTI persons which is then transferred uh, online it's true that Cyprus has had uh, a terrible time financially over the last uh, 10 years, let's say. There has been a change in the demographics of the country. As a result of the financial crash, there has been large-scale, massive changes in the economy. And yet, and yet, politically, far-right parties haven't had the kind of uh, political spectacular that they've had in other countries. So, again... Some people might hear what you say and say, well, look, there is also the fundamental decency and generosity of Cypriots. That means that most of the people uh, are against this hate speech and and do not support it politically at election time. What do you make of that? Okay, so two things I make of this. Uh, We have a far-right party which recently elected persons uh, to the parliament's and uh, recently, in, in the last presidential elections, they had a candidate. Um, that, for me, is enough to demonstrate that we are not on the right path, because they haven't been... But that is democracy, them. you would argue that, right? That's democracy. What was, democracy. The, share of their, what was the share of their vote? Very, very low, very right. low. But, but they, did, they did get two people in Parliament last time. About democracy, though, I'll tell you something. They are, I mean, they go to Greece and they, uh, there's a clear uh, link with Golden Dawn. And we all know what Golden Dawn is. We all know that Golden Dawn is currently under trial. We all know what they've been doing uh, these past over 10 years, violent and non-violent acts. They have a direct link with them. Uh, And 
I think that that is completely unnecessary. We are an island of less than a million, a manageable number of people that should not, A, have fallen into this financial crisis, right? I mean, we're not even a million. And B, if things were done properly in all levels of, us, of our society, we wouldn't have had those people in Parliament now. It's unnecessary. That's the second thing. And the third thing is a lot of the rhetoric uttered by the far right is anyhow in our mainstream, right? And don't forget that with the far right party here, they have such an easy time because they can use the political problem to their benefit very, very well. Uh, so it, 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 it's, it's a shame. It's happened. Um, but I hope that it's not going to go, you know, much further. I just think it's unnecessary for a country like Cyprus to, to have had to experience that. Earlier this year, Dr. Archiviadi, you wrote in a German language blog that anti-hate speech legislation developed on an international and European level is marred by what you referred to as the hierarchy of hate. Yeah. What did you mean by that and how can legislation be improved? Okay, so that's one of the other problems I have with the legislation uh, in terms of the fact that the International Co uh, Convention on, 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 on Tackling Racism, of course, deals only with racist hate speech because the convention itself is about racism. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights only deals with advocacy for um, hate against ethnic groups, ethnic or religious groups. The framework decision of the European Union, again, the same. It's all about protecting ethnic and religious groups. The additional protocol to the Cybercrime Convention on hate speech, which was passed because America, which is also part of the Cybercrime Convention, did not want a hate speech regulatory framework, so they had to make a separate protocol. That only deals with racist and xenophobic material online. So I'm coming and I'm seeing an entire international and European framework with absolutely no regulation when the speech is homophobic or transphobic. So is it less hurtful if I'm a victim of hate speech or then I'm a victim of hate crime because of that hate speech if I'm gay or if I'm lesbian? Is it? Is it worse? No. So why does the law only protect particular groups which are related to ethnicity or religion? So when it comes then to improving the law, what you want is an extension of the definition to include other groups? Yes, definitely. And this was also a resolution of the European Parliament. Uh, the European Parliament uh, passed a resolution underlining that it's necessary for other groups to be incorporated. It's unfair that the 2008 framework decision of the European Union only deals with those groups. I mean, we've had so much time to develop our legal landscape. Why, why are they missing? I just... I don't get it, and they well, should be incorporated, and at some point they will be. In answer your own question, uh, Doctor, why are they missing? Because I'll tell you why, what I think, how I justify it, because I needed to find a way to justify it, because it can't just be a mission. Um, the documents like the ICCPR, so the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the Convention on, on Racism were very, very post-World War II documents, even if the Covenant was passed in 76, the Convention in 65, they're very, they've got that thinking of that never again about, you know, World War II with the ethnic and religious groups being uh, targeted, because that was very much what was the framework of the UN at the time, even though, for example, gay people were also persecuted, that wasn't focused on as much. Uh, with the framework decision uh, of the European Union, which came so many years later, I mean, 10 years ago, 2008, I think that the EU was just so concerned about incorporating other groups because of the fear of free speech um, um, uh, saga which was anyhow incorporated when it was about protecting ethnic groups and religious groups. Um, and there is this kind of thinking that, you know, what race... I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to say it, that, and if you also see it in the minutes of the different meetings of the different assemblies, etc., that racist speech is just more uh, harmful. There is that thinking. And that's why we have this.
That's going to change now. We're moving towards the end of our conversation now, Dr. al Kibiadu. So let me put to you a question that I ask of all of the people who are uh, kind enough to be my guest in these deep dive conversations. Does the arc of history bend towards progress? Oh, um, you got me by surprise there. Yeah. Um, does it? I see it not. I see it like a a wave. I don't see an arc. I see a wave. We're a bit down now. Maybe we'll go up. But then, even if we're like the ancient Greeks used to say, it, if you if you're up, then you'll go down, and then you'll go up again. I think that's what we see in history. Up and down, up and down, up and down. It's just we know we no longer have any justification to be down, down, down in terms of human rights and democracy anymore. I mean, we are the ones making a mess of it. No one else. When you look to the future, Dr. Alkiviadu, what kind of web environment would you like to see? We've spent a lot of time now talking about hate speech, mm. how it affects people's lives. You talked about the people that you work with who who are forced to see the, the terrible consequences of hate speech. So... What kind of web environment would you like to see in the future? Right. The kind of environment, well, there's two answers. Firstly, I'd like to see in the distant future a, a society which has eliminated all this structural discrimination that we have and all the, this stuff that we spoke about before, because that's a long-term solution. On a short-term solution, I would like the social platforms themselves, and they are definitely working towards that framework, I think, to be actively part, not only of the regulation, because regulation really isn't the answer, uh, of, of counter-narratives, of actively partaking in that development of the alternative narrative of counter narratives actually gaining proper support both on an institutional level and it slowly is for example by by the european commission and slowly by the the, the, the social media platforms and and to have uh, social media platforms develop themselves in, in, into a framework where we can we can have that other idea as well uh, that, that's what I think would, would help for the moment, facilitating technologically, for example, counter-narratives online. Because at the moment, just merely technologically, it's quite difficult to put forward your counter-narrative. Uh, so infrastructural amendments to this end, I think, would be a big help. All right, well, there's a couple of points there, Doctor. Um, on the issue of counter-narratives, for too many people, counter-narrative sounds like two legs bad, four legs good. So how do we, how do we make counter-narratives not feel like the tool of those with political power who want to push a particular idea? You know, I was always concerned about that. And then the other, yesterday I was having a discussion with one of my colleagues uh, about a project that we're writing. And she said something which I think is actually the answer. Don't just respond to the narrative. Have some kind of facts first. So that could be a, a definition, that could be a law, that could be something to do about rights. So if there's a whole discourse on refugees and how they're, um, you know, ruining our economy. Put a few facts before you put your 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 discourse. Do you see what I mean? A, a lot of the counter narratives. It may seem like a, a you know a plain answer, but it's actually quite important because what we just see now is passionate responses of activists. But that's, that's it's not going to get us anywhere. But a few facts from proper sources which are cited, and then a logical reasoning quickly and, you know, reasonably, um, I think would help much more. But haters are haters. I mean, counter-narratives, the impact of counter-narratives can't be, you know, uh, great. There's a, there's a limit to their impact, but at least to have it, to have the, 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 the internet and the web to be, you know, a little bit more moderate um, and fair. It's almost like a, a political um, uh, debate. It's the contest for the middle ground. You, you're not going to reach yes. uh, a hate monger with a counter narrative, but you could reach that group in the in the exactly. centre that hasn't really made up its mind and can go either way. Exactly. And and to this, I underline it time and again. When we think of hate speech and then subsequently hate crime, is we th we think of two actors: the victim and the perpetrator. Actually, it's three, and the third one is so absolutely important, and that's a bystander. And just too many of us have, because this situation has been normalized to such an extent, we are just a passive bystander, right? And that passive bystander either can react 
or it's what you said before could be affected by this so that counter narrative in my opinion would be targeted to that bystander to be um, sure of that yeah you talked about the internet service providers you said that regulation wasn't really the answer but why not we know there have been studies and, and you talked about where we met at a, a no hate speech uh, campaign conference i think somebody alluded to that that if you look at the business model of a youtube you may well start looking at a video on simple vegetarianism and within uh, a few clicks you're mm. you're looking at videos that discuss extreme Extreme veganism or the, the, the raw food movement. So why isn't regulation the answer? Isn't it only the pressure of financial penalties that will encourage the social media platforms towards a more responsible approach to their social vocation that is becoming more and more pronounced as the online space becomes part of our offline lives? Yeah, I mean... When I say regulation is not the answer, I would, um, it's not the answer alone. I mean, we can't just think, I'm taking down hate speech off Facebook, now I have the code of conduct with the commission, with the different IT companies, and things are going to be good. No, they're not. Of course, it's part of the framework insofar that it is handled adequately and properly. And we're not removing speech, which actually does fall within the framework of free speech, because then we're going down a different and dangerous path. And B, if I take something off Facebook or whatever, any other social platform, it can appear so easily. It's, just, it's also the, the, the nature of the Internet itself, the number of users, the frequency of use. It's also the technical side. And also the fact that hate speech, there's no one single answer. There are different routes. I think that that's probably what what I would say. Dr. Natalie Alkibiadi, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.